to see you. Let's stand and sing this together. That completely made me forget what I was going to say when I got up here. And uh, yeah, yeah, that'd be a first, wouldn't it? I mean, that would be a first. I started, I started, but I thought I'll, uh, maybe I'll, I'll spare you tonight. I think Joy and I were singing something on that course, uh, and I started to get her up here, and uh, let's do that course again. And we'll do that sometime, just a closer walk, just sing that, just a closer walk all the way through there again and again and again. And I got a feeling that some of those folks that are watching us tonight uh, at home, you're probably doing that. And if you're singing, you can sing it any way you want to. Uh, if you're watching us at home tonight, watching this service, we welcome you. And uh, we're glad that you're with us and glad you're here. We're glad you're there. And uh, most of all, we're glad the Lord is here. Amen. 
and he always comes to be with us. I'm talking about a subject tonight. We introduced on Sunday evening. Uh, that's not talked a whole lot about in the church, uh, but it's in the Bible. There are two men in the Bible. This is, uh, it's said about these two men. Of course, you already see it on the screen tonight. Moses, uh, a man in the Old Testament, uh, and we saw some things about uh, Moses on Sunday night and what meekness meant to him. And of course, the greatest example of meekness is the Lord Jesus himself, for he invited people to come to him. And he said, if you come to me, I am meek and lowly of heart. And if you come to me, you shall find rest unto your soul. Meekness is not weakness. We have the idea sometimes that meekness means that a person is very meek and mild and uh, he don't have any strength. But we learn, and I hope we'll learn, uh, that uh, meekness, according to what the Bible says to us and teaches us, it is strength that is under control. It is a person that is strong, but he keeps that strength under control. We also learned on Sunday night uh, that meekness is not a gift of the Spirit. It is the fruit of the Spirit. Uh, if it was a gift that God gave to certain people, then there may be people who would have the excuse of saying, I have a reason that I'm not meek because God did not give me the gift of meekness. He gave me the gift of strength. Uh, but according to what we learn in the Bible, that it is a fruit of the Spirit. When Paul wrote to the church at Galatia, writing about the fruit of the flesh, and then he talked about the fruit of the Spirit. Uh, one of the fruits of the Spirit is meekness and gentleness. And of course, you know what fruit does. It does not grow overnight. Uh, fruit has to be cultivated. Uh, sometimes you grow fruit and sometimes you don't grow fruit. Sometimes we are meek and other times we are not meek. It is a fruit. I think I know a lot of folks that's got crop failure when it comes to when it comes to meekness, they don't have a whole lot of meekness in their life. Uh, but we're learning that it is a virtue. It is something that God puts in us and then he cultivates that by the Spirit of God, by the Word of God, so that we would bear this fruit of meekness. And so we all would agree tonight, I think we'll all say amen to the fact uh, that it is, it, is a, it is a fruit that is, should be desirable. It is a fruit that, uh, that will have an impact on people. And uh, if we live close to the Lord and follow Him and come to Him, we'll learn what it means to be a meek individual. Doesn't mean that you are weak. Doesn't mean that you just lay down and have no, no opinion about anything. That's not what meekness is. Uh, so I, I've come tonight in this service, and for those that are watching us, and I do not come uh, with my own opinion of what I think meekness is. Because I say if we went around this auditorium tonight, and for others, we'd probably say, well, what do you think meekness is? I think everybody would have an opinion of what meekness is. Uh, but do you know that in the long run that it really doesn't matter what I say about it and it really doesn't matter what you say about it. But it does matter what the scripture says about whether we are meek like the Lord Jesus. So you didn't know you were going to be put to the test tonight. There is a test that is found in the scripture and I'm going to ask a series of questions and then I'm going to support what I say with the word of God 
about this biblical test for weakness. And I'm going to ask you to think about it when I ask these questions. And uh, I, I want you to just think, am I a meek person? And if you might leave here tonight and say, I don't have that fruit in my life. I would pray that all of us would determine that we would learn and grow this fruit of meekness in the Christian life. Are you ready? Are you ready? <laughs> all right, I just want to find out. Here's a test. Find out whether we pass the test or whether we fail the test. And I I tell you, when I I came up with all these questions and these observations out of the Scripture, I had to bow my head and say, Lord, there are some areas in my life where I failed that test, where I did not pass the test when it comes to this matter of meekness. Number one, boy, right at the start, right at the beginning of this test tonight, here's a real challenge about whether we are meek. We have this fruit of meekness in our life. Number one, here it is. How do I respond to opposition? How do I respond to opposition? When somebody opposes you, somebody disagrees with you, How do you respond to it? Are you that person that says, well, preacher, don't you know I'm always right? (laughs) And my opinion is the only opinion that matters. Well, just you better hold on to your seat tonight. (laughs) I want to share with you what the Bible says about it. Fine, and you might want to highlight these in your Bible. 2 Timothy chapter 2, beginning... Beginning in verse 22. Um, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 22. Here Paul writing to young Timothy. Now flee you for lust and follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace with them that call on the, on the Lord out of a pure heart. Verse 23 says, But foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing that they do gender strives. Boy, you could stop there and just elaborate on that for a long time. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, and patient. In meekness, you notice this first? In meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. Here's a person arguing with themselves. They'll argue with you, argue with themselves. But in meekness, you instruct them if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. How do I I respond to people uh, that I disagree with? Now I know, I know tonight in this service that everybody here tonight would say, why preacher, don't you know everybody just gets along with me? And everybody just disagree, uh, agrees with me? And there's really not an opposition. Let me just read that verse again, if you will. Uh, verse 25. You need to look at it again. He said, in meekness, whatever you do to a person that you disagree with, you're to do what you do with the attitude of meekness. You instruct those that oppose themselves. And maybe God will give them repentance to the acknowledge of the truth. It's a possibility the way you handle that it could be that God could be able to lead them to repent of the wrong that they believe. You know, the the context of this passage is that they're not wrong, you're right and they're wrong, but you do know, you do know how you approach somebody, how you talk to somebody, how you witness to somebody, how you relate to somebody, 
A lot of it has to do in how you do it. You may say, well, bless God, I've got the truth, but I want to tell you, if you use it like a sledgehammer on somebody's head, you done lost the battle before you get started. Mm. Well, how you doing out there? We ain't got past the first one yet. How we doing? How do, how do I respond? How do I respond with somebody that disagrees with me? I Trust me, you won't have to go very far in this life. You'll find a lot of people that disagree with you. And the matter is, how do I respond to them? Number two, your second thing. Second one, and I found these, I found these uh, issues because I found scripture that talks about it. How do I respond to? A, so say I've got a spouse, I've got a, I've got a husband, I've got a wife that is an unbeliever. How do I respond to that unbeliever that I'm living with in my house? Do you know the greatest witness and the greatest influence on that person you're living with that is not a believer is not the preacher down at the church house in the pulpit. It's the person they are living with in the home day by day. Years ago, I, I, I probably shared this with you. It made such an impact on me. I was preaching in revival somewhere down near Shelby. Never had been to the church before. I knew the pastor from over in the mountains. And he was pastoring down near Shelby. And he wanted me to come down there to preach. So I went down to preach revival for him. Didn't know anybody in church. Didn't know. I just knew him and his wife. Didn't know anybody. Never been there before in my life. I sat down on the front pew. And they went through the song service. The choir sung. And they did the special music. And I got up to preach. And so it's night after night. Uh, I mean, they just sung and rejoiced in the Lord. And uh, on the end of the choir, on the end of the choir, was an elderly, elderly lady. And uh, she was just singing. I don't even know she even looked at the music, whatever. She was just singing and just rejoicing and having a great time in the Lord and just praising God, smiling, just just, just rejoicing full of herself every night of the revival. And I sort of leaned over to the pastor and I asked him about her. I said, now who is this lady up there on the end of the choir? She's got such a smile on her face. She's got so much joy in her heart. And she's just so full of joy and she's so full of praise to God. And when I preach, she does the same thing. And I sort of expected him to say, well, uh, boy, you ought to go down to her house. This lady has got it made. This lady has, uh, I mean, she's got a wonderful life. And he said, uh, after service, I'll talk to you about her. After the church service, he said, the lady you asked me about, he said, if you only knew her home where she comes from. She's got an unbelieving husband. He is, uh, he is an alcoholic. And uh, when he comes home from work, he drinks and drinks uh, until he sort of passes out. That's the only way she can come to church. Uh, he don't want her to leave the house. He don't want her to come to church. And so she comes to church while he's there asleep on the couch. And she comes and praises God. She goes back home. And then she has to wait till he goes to bed and goes to sleep to get her Bible out and to read God's Word because he don't want her to open a Bible in their home. And he said, if you only knew what she... And this is the only source of her joy and praise unto God. But he said, you know what she says? She said, I'm going to love him and I'm going to love God and the great, he'll never go down to that church and hear anybody preach, but the greatest message he'll ever see is in my heart and in my life. So I'm asking us, to, how do you respond to an unbelieving spouse? 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 1 and 2. Here's what the Bible said, 1 Peter chapter 3. Verse 1 and 2, Likewise, you wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word. Here is an unbelieving spouse. They also may, 
without the word be won by the conversation of the wise. And by the way, that word conversation doesn't mean what she's talking about. That conversation is the way she lives her life in front of him. While they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear, who's adorning, you don't have to let it be with an outward adorning of the plant in the hair, the wearing of gold or putting on of apparel. He didn't say a wife should not do that. But he said that's not the main thing. That's not what's going to attract this man who's an unbeliever. But the thing that's going to get his attention is you let it be the hidden man of the heart and that which is not corruptible. Even the ornament, listen, here's what you ought to wear, of a meek and quiet spirit which is in the sight of God of great price. greatest thing you can put on, the greatest garment you can wear is meekness and a quiet spirit. Most men do not need somebody preaching to them every day about how wrong they are. Are you hearing me? Are you listening to me? Most men, I'll tell you what, they'll reject that. I'll tell you what, you just live with a meek and a quiet spirit and live out your faith in front of them and love God and love them. And they'll know there's something different about you. And the Bible said that is a great price in the sight of God. How do I respond to them? Not easy, I'm just telling you. It's not easy. You, you know the context of Scripture? He said the way you're going to impress your husband, not necessarily physically, but it's going to be what's in the heart. How you doing? <laughs> How we doing? Here's question number three. Not only how do I respond to an unbelieving husband, just how do I respond to unbelievers in general? What do unbelievers say to me? You got your Bibles out of 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 10 through 15. 1 Peter chapter 3. Verse 10 through 15, I want you to listen to it. For he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil. By the way, I, I never have met a happy grumbler, have you? Have you ever met anybody that's happy and just thrilled with life, grumbling all the time? They grumble in the morning, they grumble at night. They grumble about... This, they grumble about it. They just find something. My Lord. I got a little poem I'm going to read to you in a couple of weeks about these grumblers. You know, you know the, one of the problems with children of Israel in the Old Testament, they just grumbled all the time. They grumbled against Moses. They grumbled against God. They grumbled about manna. They grumbled about uh, water. They grumbled about, they just constantly were grumblers. But if you're going to love life and see good days, Tell God to do something with your tongue. Preacher preached about, his, about the tongue and what it did and all how dangerous it was. Lady came down. He didn't hold his tongue. Lady came down to Timothy. She said, Preacher, I want to lay my tongue on the altar. He said, That altar's 10 foot long. If you can get it on there, just help yourself. <laughs> well, I just want. I just, I just want to say, if you want to love life and see good days, restrain your, restrain your tongue from evil and your lips that they speak no guile. Let him eschew evil, stay away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and ensue it. 
for the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous. His ears are open unto our prayers, but the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. And who is he that will harm you? If you be followers of that which is good. But and if you suffer for righteousness sake, happy, of you, happy are you, and be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you. With what? With meekness and fear. Mm. The assumption there, somebody's going to see something in you and they're going to ask you, what's the difference about you? Why aren't you responding the way other people do? He says when they ask you that, you tell them why you are a believer, but you do it with gentleness, meekness, and fear. Respond in such a way with meekness. How you doing? Just thought I'd ask. Number four, how do I respond? Listen, this is how I respond when I am confronted with the truth. Now you go back to James chapter 1, verse 19 through 21. And listen to what James said about our life of faith. He says, my beloved brethren, let every man, I don't leave anybody out, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. Somebody said, that's why God gave you two ears. You're to be swift to hear and one mouth. For the wrath of man... Just blow up and get angry all you want to, but it will not work the righteousness of God. Mm. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your soul. When the truth confronts me, how do I respond to it? Verse 22. Same chapter, verse 22 through 24. Listen to what it says. James chapter 1. Verse 22 through 24. But be ye doers of the word, not hearers only deceiving your own selves. For if any man be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. He beholdeth himself, goeth his way straightway. He forgets what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continues therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. How do I, how do I respond when this word confronts me? And by the way, if you read this word, and if I preach this word, brother, you better believe it will confront every one of us. There's not a person that can come in this building, sit on these pews, and say nothing in there applies to me. How do I respond to it? In meekness, he said, we receive the truth. When I know that I'm wrong, how do I respond to it? How do I respond? It tells us if you're meek, you receive that correcting word. How you doing? Just thought I'd ask. Number five, how do I respond 
in a difficult situation? How do I respond? You do find yourself in difficult situations, don't you? I mean, we're not home yet. We're not in heaven. So we're traveling through this world. There's a lot of difficulty along the way. And, and when you read in the Bible and talk about this matter of meekness, it talks about these other, talks about these matters of difficulty. We find ourselves in difficult situations individually, as a, as a pastor, as a, as a husband, as a wife. As a church, we find ourselves in difficult situations. Not only what we do about it, but how we do it. It's so important. For example, for example, when a brother falls into sin. Brothers and sisters are not perfect. Do you know that? Do you know that brothers and sisters are not perfect? And the reason I know that because I'm not perfect and you're not perfect. And so we all fall well, when a brother falls, how do we handle that? How do I respond to it? Now, I know the Baptist way. I know how Baptist responds. When somebody in their fellowship falls or gets out into sin or, or, or they, they do all kind of crazy stuff and all that, I sort of know the traditional way that Baptists handle that. I are one. I've been in Baptist churches all of my life, so I know the traditional, brother, the rumor mill will get started before you can get to the house. And you're on the phone, you're on the internet, you're on, and you're, t did you hear this? Somebody told me this, and, uh, and somebody else told them that. And, and what do you do about it? Well, you respond back and, uh, oh my. If I'm a meek person, I'm going to tell you the scripture gives us an idea. It tells us what we ought to do about it. Got your Bibles? Galatians chapter 6 and verse 1. This passage is talking about a brother or sister. Uh, here's somebody, somebody, a scandal is about them, and they got caught. And somebody says, well, I know what we all do. We're, we're just going to get our little group together and we're going to go straighten them out. We're going to call them on the carpet. Well, I, I just ask you to read the scripture. Brethren, means he's talking to God's people. Brethren, if a man is overtaken in fault, you which are spiritual. Now, by the way, I just say this, in passing, you which are spiritual, that eliminates a lot of people. And if you ain't spiritual, and walking with God, don't go try to straighten somebody else out. That's not walking with God. <laughs> you that are spiritual, restore such a one. But how do you do it? How do you restore them? You know what that word restore means there? It is, it is, the, it is the idea what a doctor does when there's a broken bone. And his job is to restore that brokenness. Well, if you got a sensitive doctor and a good doctor, he didn't come in with a sledgehammer trying to beat that bone back into shape. I know some church members, they got to take a sledgehammer to everything that's coming and going. And all I can say to you, you do more damage than you do good. Restore such a one. It's like a doctor who is careful with his patient and he gently and he carefully puts that back in the joint, puts it back together, and he said you're to do it in the spirit of meekness. Did you see that word there? Meekness. And when you do it, you're to consider yourself lest thou also be tempted. Mm. Now we're not to say, could I tell you, we're not to say, did you hear about so-and-so? 
Well, no, I didn't hear. Well, let me tell you then. If you if you're behind, let me catch you up to date on it. Keep your nose out of everybody else's business. I just can't believe they did that. Paul said if you run upon that situation you better consider yourself. You better be careful because you can be overtaken with the same temptation that they were overtaken with. How do I respond? That's a difficult situation. I'm just going to go straighten it out. You better check. Just, just, just make sure that you know things are right at your house. You find a brother that falls into sin. How do you respond? How do you respond? Your scripture plainly tells us how do we respond with, with meekness in our heart. Here's, here's a good one. Here's a good one. How, how do I deal with people of God? When I meet with my church family, what kind of fellowship I would be? How should I be? Well, listen, how to respond to people when I come together. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1, 2, and 3. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1, 2, and 3. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you, writing to the church at Ephesus, I beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called, How you to, how you to walk with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring everything within your power to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Boy. Isn't that sin a lot? Isn't that sin a lot? You say, well, why should we do that? Well, just skip down to verse 4 through 6. And the scripture says this. You know why we ought to do everything we can to keep unity? Because there is just one body. And there is one spirit. Even as you are called unto one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. My gracious. Somebody said the most divided place in the world is on Sunday morning when people who claim they love the same Lord come under the same roof in the church house and they're so divided. How do I respond? You got Jesus in you and I got Jesus in me. <laughs> We're serving the same God. We have the same faith. We have the same Lord. Amen. I'll tell you, that's the thing that unites us tonight. Oh, brother. Well, I don't like what someone says. Well, who cares? I just want to say, who cares? I'm, I'm, I didn't come down here for that anyway. Did you? I didn't come down here and say, well, I like the color paint on that wall better than I like something else. Lord, I, I'll, I'll ask for forgiveness when I get on. Who cares? <laughs> Just grateful we got a building to be in. Amen? Just grateful we got a place to worship. We're not here to worship this bit. We're here to worship this one Lord with one faith and one spirit and one God. We worship him. By the way, by the way, anytime God starts adding to the church, and anytime people come into the church and new people come in the church and 
all this, there's always that potential, always that possibility of disagreement. So like a, just sort of like a family. I sort of think the church ought to be sort of like a family. You know, when you've got a family and it's only you and your spouse, They but one of you going to be right, and that's you. <laughs> Just thought I'd let you. <laughs> but if you have a child, then you got to worry about somebody else, right? Because I assure you, when that child grows up a little bit, they'll let you know they're right. And the more children you have, the more possibility there is for disagreement and different ideas and arguments. I mean, you, you, you get a car full, you and your wife and three or four kids. And you say, where are we going to eat? Every child, tell me what they're going to say. McDonald's, McDonald's. <sighs> we got to go to McDonald's, got to go to McDonald's. I said, we went there the other day. I don't care. I want, to, I want McDonald's. I don't care. I buy your steak. All I want is chicken McNuggets. All I want is what McDonald's. Gets. And you said, you know what? You're, I just ask you husbands. I just ask you husbands. You don't have to raise your hand. How many of you have said, going down the road, if it's going to be this big ordeal, I'm turning this car around and we're going back to the house and we ain't going nowhere. True. You ever said that? Yes. Be honest with me. Amen. We ain't a fussing about that. I'm paying the bill anyway. I'll go, we'll go where I say we're going. But the more children you have, the more ideas, the more disagreements, the more you have to have patience. So, isn't that the way with the church family? Somehow when the Lord has people. <laughs> you know, they, they may, not, may not have come where you came from. Most of us grew up in the South. It's been ingrained in us. I'm telling you what. Man. But uh, people move around and come into the church. They, have, they may have a different opinion. All these kind of things. But you have to remember we're all in the same family. And we've got the same God. And we've got the same Lord. And we've got the same faith. And when we go to heaven, we're going to heaven. But how do I respond? You'll respond some way or another. Talk in this matter. How do you respond to an unbelieving world? How do you respond to this world? We rub shoulders with the unbelieving world. And I will assure you tonight how I respond to them says a whole lot more than what I say with my mouth. I read your scripture, Titus chapter 3 verse 1. Titus chapter 3 and verse 1. He's not talking about, he's not talking, he's talking to believers. He's talking to us when we're in this world. Put them in mind. Paul wrote to Titus. His responsibility as a pastor. Put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers. To obey majesty. To be ready to every good work. To speak evil of no one. No man. To be no brawlers. But gentle. Showing all meekness unto all men. Boy, it's something we have to live with, don't we? I'm going to be honest with you. Because I've been honest with myself and I've had to be honest with God. There are just some times 
I'd just like to go visit a politician and take them by the nap of the neck and look them in the eye and shake them and say, where is your brain? Do you not have any sense at all? You know, some of the stuff they come up with and the way they talk sometimes, I, I like sometimes, uh, how can you, and they'll get up and talk about God and how much they believe in God and all, and I'll say, well, how can you believe in God when you, when you propose and you vote about all these things that are anti-family and anti-children and uh, you vote to abort little babies and all this stuff and all the same time you're talking about your faith in God and all this. I just want to tell you, I, I just... And then the Lord says to me, go ahead and get it out of your system. Just go ahead. But you better talk to me before you go to bed tonight if you plan on sleeping and uh, get things right with me. I'm talking about we live in this world. We live in this antagonistic world we're living in. Can you imagine the early church? Because of their faith, they were thrown to the lines. Because of their faith. That scripture said. We're to be gentle. With all meekness. And it's to be unto all men. Boy isn't, 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 that, isn't that. Boy don't that seem almost impossible. You read all these scriptures. And all of them are, says here's what you do. And this is how you to be. But when you're dealing with the world, when you're dealing with God's people, when you're dealing with your family, when you're dealing with your spouse, how you deal with it, be gentle about it. Be meek about it. You don't have to be a brawler, he said. Now somebody may say tonight, but pastor, we read all these scriptures Does it pay to be that way? Sound like to me that you're going to come up on the losing end. You're going to be the loser. <laughs> I mean, you, you're just not going to ever get ahead. You're not going to be a winner. Is it worth it to live with meekness in your heart? We all live with this thing. Will, it, will, ever, will things ever be made right? Will there be justice in the land? Well, I'm here to tell you, I'm going to give you a verse. There's coming a day. <laughs> Praise God. Here's what the Bible said. Listen to it. Here's what the scripture said. When Jesus was given all those beatitudes, blessed are the meek. You've got a better day coming, he said. <laughs> For the meek shall inherit the earth. Isn't it interesting that the meek person sometimes sees, seems to be the doormat of this world? Yes. Our faith seems to be ridiculed. We're made light of. We seem to be what your values and if you believe the Bible and believe what God says, we're laughed at and all that stuff. But I'm telling you, there is coming, there is coming a day when the Lord is going to come and justice shall reign and the meek are going to rule and reign with him in this world. That's a promise that God made to his people. Again, I say, this is not a nat natural ability to do this. It is not the gift of the Spirit. As if to say some can have. It is the fruit of the Spirit. And when the Spirit of God is allowed to be in our lives and work in our hearts and cultivate us, He can produce that fruit of meekness. I don't find a lot of people lining up and say, yeah, I'm, I'm for that. I want meekness. Well, it takes time to develop that fruit in your life. Could I challenge 
my own heart? Could I challenge those that are listening? Could I challenge you that are here tonight? Oh, God, would you somehow develop in me the right spirit, meekness, and it'll pay off one day. It'll be worth it all one of these days. It'll be worth it all. I wish I could stand here tonight, but you know I would not be truthful if I stood here and say, you know, ever since I've been a Christian, I've always been a meek person. <laughs> uh, that's not true about any of us. You say, well, I just know some people that are naturally, they naturally are this way. Well, I say there are some people that are better spirited than others. I say some that have a better spirit and attitude about them than others. Amen. Some of that comes from your home life, from your mom and daddy and what you learned at home and if you wanted to live as a do or die, they'd beat all the rest of it out of you. You know, if you're going to, you, you just can't think this, you can't do it. But I want to tell you there's something in there only the Spirit of God can produce. We'll allow him to do it. We'll allow him to do it. Moses, when his brother and sister, we read that Sunday night in the book of Numbers, they got the idea that Moses thought he is better than them. And they started grumbling about it. Family feud going on. When Moses and Aaron and Miriam, my wife Miriam, excuse me, forgive me for what I'm saying tonight. I'll talk about that when I get home. <laughs> she knows the story. And they got up there and complaining and they started telling. Who does Moses think he is? He thinks he's better than we are. Yeah, you, you ever heard that? They think they got more authority, more say so. We're just as much an authority as he is. He's not walking on us. We'll stand up to him. And Moses. A little phrase in there said, and Moses was meek. And Moses went to the Lord. Because Miriam suffered because of what she did. And Moses, you know what he did? He went and prayed for her. <laughs> and he asked God to heal her. I tell you about his meekness. He didn't say, Lord, lay it on her. I mean, get it, beat her, beat it out of her. He didn't say that. That's what we'd do. Why, they're getting just exactly what they deserve. Have you ever said that? Don't shake your head. I'll shake mine for me. I've said, well, but Moses prayed for him. And God heard his prayer and God healed her. So if there are people out there that oppose you and do all, say all kinds of things, you know the best thing you do is just pray for them. Just pray for them. No one of the Bible said and there were times Moses got mad. There's the time Moses got angry. There's the time Moses did wrong. Moses wasn't perfect. But Jesus was. <laughs> so I'm, I'm asking you to pray for me. And I'll pray for you, which I do. And we'll pray for one another. Lord, may this fruit grow in our lives. It takes time sometimes for fruit to grow in our lives. And I, I just let you in on this. You know, some of that, some of that, when you get a little older, age and maturity has a lot to do with that, don't they? Because the things that you'd fuss and fight over when you were younger, after you get a little older, you think, it ain't worth it. It ain't worth it. Would you stand with me tonight? I was in I was in Mission Hospital today. Saw uh, Kaylin, Chris Higgins. She was still in intensive care today. They were looking for a room to get her out. 
uh, tomorrow, they're putting a defibrillator in her. Um, 30 something years of age. And uh, he thought she was asleep on the couch. Tried to wake her up, heart had stopped beating. And uh, about 10 minutes, he did CPR on her. Got the EMS there, got the people in this county there and worked with her a couple hours. He said, Preacher, when we came up the mountain, said, uh, they had her in that vehicle. I didn't know whether she was going to be dead or alive when I got there. But he got there and the Lord had revived her. And uh, she, she said to thank you. So many of you have texted her and got in touch with her. She said, thank you. Thank you so much for praying for her. And uh, pray for him. So uh, this is what they're going to do tomorrow. I know you're praying for Miriam. I've had her in Asheville today as well. Uh, the surgery on Friday for her Friday morning and ask you to pray and know that you do and ask you to pray. And when they get through and I know something, I'll do a one call and just let you know what's, uh, what's going on. Um, so pray, pray for her. Five others you want to mention. Amen. 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 Yes. Amen. Okay. Let's remember this request. Yes. All right. All right. Remember this request. These names that have been mentioned. Yes. We'll do that. Remember this request. Yes. Okay. All right. Yes. 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 We do that. Yes. Remember Tony tomorrow. We'll remember him as well. Somebody else? Yes. Amen. Yes. We'll do that. Somebody else, somebody else. All right. Let's pray. Father, we believe your word. It is your truth to our hearts. <clears throat> it is a mirror that holds up before us and we look at our lives and look at our heart. Lord, we confess, we confess how how what a failure we are in so many areas. Lord, we, we ask tonight for the working of the Holy Spirit in our lives to help us uh, to have this fruit of the Spirit, especially in this matter, not only of love, joy, and peace, and long-suffering, and temperance, kindness, but gentleness and meekness, Lord, I, I pray we'll allow the Spirit of God to produce that in us. And then, Lord, you've heard every prayer need tonight. That is our request. And then you've heard every prayer need, every name, every need, every person that cares enough to call in and notify us. And then for people that, that hear, they're here to pray for others. And, Lord, we, we know you're a big God and you can take every prayer need. Uh, those that are having procedures tomorrow, then on Friday, and then those that are anticipating uh, other matters in the weeks to come. Lord, there are those that are dealing with issues day by day. 
And they're just living and they're depending on your strength and your grace. And I know it's not easy, but thank you that your grace is sufficient for their need. We thank you for allowing us to be here tonight and just to study what your word says, says to us. And so many areas of our life where we need to grow and we need to improve in so many areas. Lord, you don't ask us to do it ourselves, but we have the power of the Holy Spirit that lives in us that will enable us and give us, us the strength to do it uh, day by day. In, in real life, help us to be faithful to you. We love you tonight and thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. God bless you for being here.